It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 273 of Science on Top. Today is Sunday the 23rd of July 2017. I'm Ed Brown and I'm joined by Penny Dumsday. Hi. And Lucas Randall. Hi Ed. And the only reason that we can do this is because of people like Ryan James, Dan Kruger, Brett Henry, EJ, Chris Curtin-McGee, Sean McElligot, Richard Sutherland and Pete Ellinger, all of whom are contributing on Patreon and giving us that money to help us cover the costs and keep doing the show. If you want to help out with that, just go to scienceontop.com slash donate. We really appreciate your support. But don't do that until after you've listened to us talk about the splitting up of the Larsen Sea ice shelf and the first humans in Australia. So, Lucas, we spoke last week about Larsen Sea, the iceberg that was twice the size of Luxembourg that broke away from the Antarctic ice shelf. Well, it's now travelled about two kilometres and it's already showing large cracks. It's likely to splinter into a number of icebergs, making it more of a threat to shipping, isn't it? True, yes, yes, uh, which we we kind of covered last week as well, that that's the uh, expected fate of the uh, previous chunk of Larsen Sea ice shelf that's, uh, that's now adrift in the Waddle Sea, but uh, there's now, uh, just a week after that, signs of a new rift, a new crack forming, uh, on the edge of, uh, of of the previous crack, which uh, you know, which broke away, um, which is heading sort of northward uh, towards a, a more vulnerable spot. Uh, I guess a, a place that sort of acts as a bit of an a uh, bit of an anchor um, for the the whole ice shelf, and then of course the glaciers that are behind it. Um, so this is potentially a little bit more alarming than the Larsen Sea. Um, you know the, the the previous break off or that that big ice carving that occurred because as we as we sort of mentioned last week the uh, that process is is seen to be fairly cyclical it's a part of the normal process as more and more snow falls you know the the ice shelf will extend out from the coastline further and further until eventually it, it breaks off and then the process sort of continues and as long as there's enough uh, you know snowfall and temperatures are, are low enough for the um, you know the ice shelf to continue to grow at a rate that is as fast as the the decay then it's you know it's it should sort of maintain its status quo so the scientists you know that there's there's some differences of opinion amongst the scientists but generally speaking the modeling that they're running at the moment is showing that there's no major cause of alarm because of the break off of that berg that's the size of Delaware or <laughs> a third of Wales or whatever all the other it weighs more <laughs> than know. 20 million titanics <laughs> How many elephants, though, Ed? Um, so, I don't know. <laughs> and are we talking African or Indian? Uh, <laughs> that's an important distinction. So this new, uh, this new rift that's just been detected, this new crack, is, is heading towards a, an area called the Borden Ice Rise. Now, I didn't know what an ice rise was. I had to look that up. And an ice rise is basically an area of an ice shelf that is uh, higher than the rest of the surrounding shelf. Just imagine a hill in the ice. And this is caused by a part of the seafloor being higher underneath the ice shelf so that the ice shelf actually grinds onto it. And, uh, you know, it's in contact with the seafloor. So as a result, it acts as a, as a bit of an anchor. It slows things down because it's pushing against the, uh, the seafloor at that point. So the, this border and ice rise, which is quite a small, you know, feature. It's only a few miles across. This is... Uh, uh, is quite important to, to keep the, the stability of the shelf behind it in check. So, again, you know, the, the uh, scientists that, um, um, the uh, Bryn Hubbard, who's the director of uh, Centre of Glaciology at uh, Abbotsworth University, said that there's nothing unusual about, uh, about this process, but and there's no direct concern from this right now, because, as I mentioned, it's, it's a normal process, and this rift that has occurred is going through a, an area of soft ice, which slows things down because it's not as brittle. So it could take quite some time to make its way through. Uh, but, you know, 
we don't actually know. It could it could be fast, it could be slow, uh, it might go in a different direction, not really sure. But it, it caught my eye because it's only a week after, you know, we've already discussed the uh, the other one breaking off. And um, yeah, there's, there's certainly, you know, certainly enough cause for alarm to keep an eye on this uh, as, as it develops. Because yeah, this this would be potentially a bit of a game changer. Because if those, if if the whole Ross, ice Larsen C ice shelf um, breaks up, the glaciers that are behind it, unlike the ice shelf itself, the glaciers behind it would contribute to sea level rise if they were to slide into the ocean, and it would be fairly significant. So yeah, we don't want that happening. That's not something we want to happen now. Mm. Um, you know, or, or you know, for quite some time. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's that's uh, why it caught my eye. No, fair enough. It, it, it's worrying, but as you say, it's sort of part of the usual cycle. So um, it's comforting that they are keeping an eye on it so closely. I mean, there's sort of 24-hour monitoring of this with satellites and people on the ground and everything. So you know, we'll be able to at least follow it and see what happens. Well, it's funny that you mentioned that in terms of the monitoring because this when they first saw this uh, the first rift which caused the breakup of the delaware sized berg um which has a name doesn't it? it's a60 something or whatever a68 anyway, whatever the name. Yep. yeah it just rolls of the tongue <laughs> um so <laughs> they they had seen this last year um and they were sort of keeping an eye on it but then during the winter period over over uh, antarctica well you know you they couldn't see it so it was only once they, uh, you know, because it's in perpetual darkness for a while. So once the sunrise occurred again, they sort of went, oh, crap, that, that's actually grown quite yeah. a bit. So, you know, there's, there was a period of not being able to keep as close an eye on it. But, um, but yeah, you know, with infrared and stuff like that, satellites, there's, uh, there's, there's more. And, and one of the satellites is keeping an eye on us at the moment. It was uh, quoted in the article that no doubt you'll link to. Yeah. Yep. All right. Well... Penny, we've talked a fair bit on the show about the difficulties of determining when humans first came to Australia. The best we've been able to say with any certainty is between 40,000 and 68,000 years ago, with most experts liking 50,000 as a good sort of compromise. But now a new study by a team from the University of Queensland has put the date back to 65,000 years. And it also suggests they were much more sophisticated in their use of tools, for example, than previously thought. Yeah, I thought this study was really interesting. And in part of me, I'm like, uh, a dating study, like... <laughs> we've I, been here before. We've been here before, <laughs> like it's a date. And in a way, these things just raise more questions than they answer. Like, hmm. where, where were the people in Papua New Guinea and, you know how come they move so quickly out of Africa and blah, 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 blah. And why did they take, why did they get so quickly from across Asia and then take so long to spend to Southern Australia? And then I think, well, how many sites are just destroyed or, hmm. you know, every data point we get so much is just yeah. not existing. Unless they're building yeah. stone houses or something. Yeah, exactly. We've really like, got little bits of here and there. Little bits of here and there and stuff that has not been destroyed subsequently. So, it's kind of, it's, you know, it's, this is a site that's been studied before and all the work was done in close sort of um, consultation with the traditional owners, which is good. And it was always a bit controversial. I think previously the site was thought to have been first occupied between fifty and 60,000 years ago. And the new dating, which was done by dating charcoal and quartz grains buried in the same level of sediment as the oldest artifacts find it's at least well no sorry not at least about 65,000 years ago so give or take 5,000 years so it could be 60 it could be 70,000 years ago and so these are some of the um well this is the oldest site in Australia I think and it's really I think quite interesting because not only are some of the tools that they were making quite sophisticated for that time. I don't know a lot about stone tools, but from what I understand, they made a thing called a ground-edged axe, which is one of the earliest, I think, in the world of this style of tool making. But also, it really, I feel this seems to really separate the arrival of humans into Australia from the extinction of the megafauna. 
which happened about 45,000 years ago. Like, it doesn't mean that humans didn't contribute to that event because, I mean, their practices could have changed or something. But it's just, it just adds another layer of um, complexity, I guess, to some of these nice, simple stories we have about human evolution. You know, you think about, oh, yeah, everyone evolved in Africa and birthed forth, ready-made and (laughs) colonised the closest bits first and, (laughs) you know, all very neat and tidy, a nice arrow on a map, and it's really not like that at all. Apparently, to get to Australia at this time span would have required an 80-kilometre journey across open sea with Stone Age technology. So you wonder if um, it was on purpose or an accident. Yeah, did they know where like, they were going? Or, or did, were they just going and exploring? Um, it would be so fascinating because I'm guessing that, I mean, I mean, I don't know. I have no idea. It would be so fascinating to meet these people because people living 65,000 years ago, I think, were, is, you know, is the same as modern humans except for different technology. And so what were you, what was going on? Yeah, I don't know. This just really that that thing about eighty kilometers of open water. And I thought that is a long way for Stone Age technology. Mm. But yeah, uh, the, I also read something that it uh, bolsters the case that uh, the ancestors of the, for the first Australians could have interbred with uh, Denisovans and the Neanderthals and that as well. Did you read anything up on that, or is it? It was more of a sort of a throwaway line in an article. Yeah, I just I just read it as that throwaway line. And I thought, oh. Yeah. I didn't know that, but maybe it's something that everyone does know and I don't, so. <laughs> well, yeah, I don't know if why it would be specific to Australians, though. Given Surely that we know anyone that, who passed through those areas would have. Yeah. Yeah. And with the Denisovans, we only know from a small cave in Siberia or whatever. We don't know how widespread they necessarily were, but it's interesting to speculate on. And also the thing about there's not as many... Um, records of humans in the islands to the north of Australia before 44,000 years ago. But then you think, well, I mean, that could just be more the difficulty of finding sites. and Yeah. yeah. And, yeah, sites that have been disrupted like, and everything or by maybe even wildlife, immersed by under sea level, weather. under the water. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so this is from a... Uh, a rock shelf in Kakadu. So it is up north, but I don't think it's right up near the very pointy end. Yeah. Pointy end. (laughs) Well, it is pointy. (laughs) It is. is. No, it's definitely there's pointiness. Um, I also uh, noted, um, uh, which links into a story we're doing afterwards as well, about the the implications for the role of the Aboriginal Australians in the extinction of megafauna. Because uh, they're saying, you know, it's it's been it's been previously suggested that Aboriginals arrived here and more or less wiped them out pretty quickly. Because obviously that would have been, you know, a great food source. But this new date potentially means that they may have coexisted for as long as twenty thousand mm. years before the megafauna actually went extinct. So that's that's quite interesting as well. Yeah, that could point to all sorts of things from just the population size of the first Australians then at the time to land management and their understanding that you can't just kill every animal you see because then there will be no food in future generations. Yeah. So it, it, it could be a number of things, but it's, yeah, very cool. Yeah, and it's not like they, they would have arrived here and had to learn from scratch what that sort of, you know, what, what those implications were because that was the life that they led no matter where they sure. were back then. They had to live off the land and not, not just pillage it, so... Especially because they would have been island hopping to get here. So they would have Mm. been used to limited resources. And when you Mm. get to Australia, you don't necessarily know how big it is. It could be limited to just how far you've explored sort of thing. So, Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, and without, you know, without the ancient knowledge that they've had in in all the... Um, all their stories and their oral history and whatever, telling them where all water mm-hmm. holes are because they haven't built mm-hmm. that up yet. Mm-hmm. It would have been a lot easier to make those, uh, a lot harder to make those crossings across the desert than than it became later on. But still, it's a it's a fairly significant time frame. And you know, as this other story said in the in New, uh, New Scientist, you know, they if they did arrive here sixty five thousand years ago, did they just sit down and wait for fifteen thousand years before spreading? You know, it's it's it seems unlikely. Mm. That's a long rest. <laughs> yeah. It seems excessive. I, I think it's more likely that those 
evidence of that migration has just been lost and that we haven't got those yeah. sites to, uh, and uh, yeah. all that. But uh, you were mentioning the megafauna down south near, on Kangaroo Island. There's been a new discovery of some fossilised footprints. Uh, we're talking Tasmania tigers, Tasmanian devils, giant uh, marsupials, flightless birds and that. So that's a really cool and exciting discovery. Yeah, so this, this was down on Kangaroo Island uh, off the coast of South Australia, so um, it was quite cool. And apparently this was a part of a study. They, they'd, um, they'd run this study right more or less from uh, um, right along the, the Victorian, you know, all the way from Victoria to Western Australian coastline, looking for various sites of value. And, and, it, and for whether it was just because of the planning or logistics, it, it, it was already, it had been designed that Kangaroo Island was in fact the last place they were going to look. Um, so it's always it, in the it's, last place you look. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, well, I've always had an issue with that saying because it's yeah, like, why yeah. would you keep looking, looking if you found it? <laughs> but, but in the case of something like this, well, you would keep looking because you want to find more. So, yeah, this, uh, this is really cool because um, they, they discovered uh, this, this trace fossil site and apparently it had hundreds of, of individual traces of, of, uh, v- of various uh, extinct animals. Uh, including uh, thylacines or your Tasmanian tigers, um, large quadrupeds, short-faced kangaroos along with possums, Tasmanian devils, goannas, shorebirds and a variety of kangaroos, you know, many of which were, were disappeared from the mainland long, you know, uh, a long time ago and some of which, you know, lived right up until, the, um, you know, we, we actually were able to take photos like the Tassie tigers, um, albeit, you know, crappy ones. But... Um, <laughs> Yeah, so they, they had quite a, uh, an interesting discovery there. But what was really cool about that is unlike, you know, fossilised remains, a jaw bone here and, a, you know, a, a, a leg bone there or whatever, tracks give you information about the living behaviour of the animals. Yeah. And when you've got tracks that actually are of multiple species, it can tell you also potentially about interactions between those species and codependence on on certain sites for certain resources and so forth so that's what made this quite uh, quite a, an interesting find was just just how much uh, information they were able to to glean from this so yeah it's uh, that's that was the main thing there's not a lot of detail in this one it just jumped out at me because of the links you know already with the first australian story that we that we just covered that uh, you know, potentially there was this megafauna even on islands, um, and I, I didn't uh, find information on on when or ever if Kangaroo Island was was ever actually joined to the mainland, or whether it was uh, you know like during ice ages and so forth. I'm not sure. It was in the article that I'm reading. Uh, it says the Kangaroo Island site has evidence of reptiles, birds, mammals, and invertebrates, potentially spanning back between twenty thousand and two hundred thousand years including when the area became separated from the mainland. Oh, there you go. Cool. So, yeah. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. So um, I, I just love this 6,500-kilometre uh, survey of beach and land that they were doing, as you say, from West Australia to Victoria. And it reminded me of the interview we did with Dr. Steve yes. Salisbury. Yeah, same. Just the northwest coast of Australia and just uh, walking and looking along thousands of kilometres of land for dinosaur footprints and evidence of ancient, you know, inhabitation and stuff. It's, it's just a mind boggling kind of exercise to think about. Yeah, it is. I mean, track tracks are cool because I guess, you know, many tracks, if they're uh, got a a lot of them, rather than just one single footprint might actually be recognizable to even a layman. So there would, there could be, um, you know, some folklore and some, some local legend about, um, about tracks that will help them find those tracks, but fossils are, are much much harder because you know you can be looking at fossils and not realise what you're seeing if you're a layman. And I, I'm, just when you were saying that about the, the survey and, and and looking for these things, it reminded me of a uh, I think it was a tweet or a Facebook post by uh, by Paul Willis, you know, for, uh, um, who mentioned uh, uh, his uh, fossil crocs on uh, on Twitter. Um, yeah, so Dr. Willis mentioned that uh, he was he was standing. At a urinal in a in a country pub or something or other, and he he looked up and there was a like a, 
some stone in the wall in front of him. It's like, oh, there's a there's a, an arthropod right in front of me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's like, did, did they know that? Like, has that? Yeah. And I'm looking at going. Really? Is it? <laughs> I trust trust you, but yeah, it's like I don't, I'm not seeing it. It's like yeah, it's clear as day. <laughs> it's like, okay. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> it makes you wonder you how you know country how, how, how many uh, fossils you, you you know are come across by laymen who don't know what they're looking at oh, and just absolutely. dismiss them. Whereas at least you know tracks, especially if they're clear trails, um, you know it might be a little bit easier to find them. But uh, yeah, yeah, pretty cool. And, and that goes to what we were saying with Penny's story about finding evidence of ancient, um, you know, inhabitation and all of that. Things like arrowheads, just small, vaguely triangular bits of rock, which most yeah. people are just going to ignore and think it's just a rock. But unless you're trained to recognize things like that. Yeah, yeah, no wonder so much evidence is to be able to see lost. that there's tooling marks on the sides of them mm. or the fact that there's 12 of them and they're almost identical. Mm. You know, yeah, I agree extraordinary work but i think that's about all we had for the show today all the links are on the website and the, in the show notes check out scienceontop.com 273 leave us your comments your feedback get in touch with us on social media or uh, leave us a review on apple podcasts and of course if you like the show and you want to help us make more go to scienceontop.com donate and make a donation on patreon thanks for joining me today penny and lucas thanks ed thank you ed this episode was edited with some giant kangaroos by Marcos Benamu. Thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. Well, scientists have a new plan for how you can save the climate. Don't have children. Just stop right now. Don't even think about it. A new study from Lund University in Sweden says the single best way to cut your carbon footprint, assuming you want to, is simply to refuse to reproduce. Deleting some humans from existence, they say, saves far more carbon than, I don't know, being a vegetarian, riding a bike to work, not boarding an airplane. Josh Fox is a director of the anti-fracking documentary Gasland and the new released film Awake, A Dream from Standing Rock. He is an environmental activist and he joins us tonight. Josh, thanks for coming on. Thank you so much. It's good to be here, Tucker. So um, not having children, that's the message. Um, it seems like a sort of a well, tough I, message. I to think that's a bit people. of a misrepresentation. I think the study okay. was saying that governments are saying we should recycle, we should change our light bulbs, we mm -hmm. should do all these sort of consumer habits. And this study was comparing those sort of very minimal efforts to cur curtail climate change with other things like not flying, being a vegetarian, not having a car, and yes, having fewer children. It didn't say don't have children. It said, right. um, you know, having fewer children and having family planning, which means you have your children maybe later in life, um, would be something that would reduce carbon emissions per, per family. That's what the study says.